Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. This is presented by SAMHSA's Game Center with the support of SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And today's webinar is on a holistic trauma-informed approach for every treatment port role, maximizing team members' effectiveness in interpersonal interactions. Our presenters today are Dr. Shannon Carey, Helen Harberts, and Dr. Brian Meyer, and I will introduce them shortly. First, I am uh, Dr. Melissa Stein. I go by pronouns she, her, and I'm a senior research associate at Dances Game Center. You should see a chat box on the bottom of your screen. Um, feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourselves. And before I, we begin our presentations, I'd like to cover a few introductory items. First, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies for the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. If you have any questions uh, for our presenters or in regards to the technology, please type them into the Q&A pod found at the bottom of your screen. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will address as many of your questions as time permits. We'll also be conducting a couple of polls throughout the presentations, and you should have just seen one pop up on your screen. We appreciate your participation. Uh, to participate, simply select and submit your response. The webinar is being recorded and we will let you know uh, when the recording is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel. We'll also be disseminating these, the slides for this webinar presentation um, in a couple of days via our games listserv. A certificate of attendance is available for download at the end of today's webinar. Please note that this certificate is for your personal portfolio and we are not able to offer CEU credits. There is ASL interpretation for today's event. Our interpreters are Kim Opperman. I'm sorry. Our interpreters are Kip Opperman and Kimberly Morialli. We also have live captioning for today's event. To view live captioning, click Live Transcript CC, then select Show Subtitles. And now I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers. Dr. Shannon Carey is a co-president and Director of Development at NPC Research in Portland, Oregon. Helen Harberts is a retired Chief Probation Officer and retired Chief Deputy District Attorney. She's based in Chico, California. And Dr. Brian Meyer is a Clinical Psychologist and the Psychology Program Manager for Community-Based Outpatient Clinics at the Central Virginia VA Healthcare System in Richmond, Virginia. He's also an Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Virginia Commonwealth University. In the interest of time, we drop the full bios for each of our speakers in the chat box. We invite you to check those out to learn more about our esteemed presenters. And now we'll just see uh, some basic observations about who's joining us today for these presentations. About 40% of you are joining from urban locations and 40% of you joining from rural locations, uh, and about 20% from suburban. So thank you so much for you all joining from those different locations. Um, and we have a, a good, about eight people, about 2% jo joining from uh, tribal lands. And in terms of your agency organization, we see many of you, 20% joining from community-based provider organization, about 20% of you joining from corrections, probation, or parole. We also see a good number of you, uh, uh, our largest percentage, uh, predictably, joining from the court setting, the judiciary, as well as many of you calling in from government, organizations, academia. So thank you so much for taking your time out of your day to join us for this presentation. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Brian, Dr. Meyer to begin the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Stein. Um, 
this is an attempt on our part to uh, begin to move the discussion of trauma-informed courts towards trauma-informed action. Uh, the opinions that we are expressing, as it says here, are not the opinions of uh, SAMHSA or the VA or the government of the United States. Um, they are ours and ours alone. Uh, so, whoops, sorry. So now, the, this is the real question, and this is the question that I've been hearing and we all have been hearing for about the past year to 18 months, which is, okay, now we're trauma-informed, we know all about trauma, now what do we do? How do we do what we do in a trauma-informed way? And there uh, was a recent study about this by uh, McKinsey and colleagues that came out this summer. And what they these were a group uh, of judges who had just received intensive uh, education for several days in uh, how to be a trauma-informed court. And they all said, basically, well, we know what trauma is. We feel pretty good. We know about the brain science about it. We know what it does to people's behavior. What do we do with it? And um, this presentation really is our answer to that question. So, um, uh, Shannon, would you tell us some about what the research says? Yes, I will, Brian. <laughs> um, so when the three of us got together to develop this training as the social science researcher in the group or the propeller head, as Helen calls me, which I'm sure she means in the kindest way possible, that I was assigned to find the research to support and inform the practices we're going to present you with today. So I searched for evidence related specifically to trauma-informed practices that are intended to help individuals who have experienced trauma feel safe and comfortable so that they can engage in treatment and the other program activities successfully you know, avoid activating panic attacks and stress and other trauma responses. So I'm not referring to specific treatment therapies that, you know, there's some clear evidence for the effectiveness of some of interventions such as seeking safety and EMDR and CBT. What I was looking for were trauma-informed practices that the judges are asking for, what do we do <laughs> with this information? So practices that are recommended for interactions between individuals and groups, such as in the courtroom or in case management appointments or community support groups. And I was actually unable to find anything about whether these practices are actually related to reduced trauma symptoms or better connection with treatment. Um, the evidence all appears to be anecdotal at this time. So, um, we do know that seeking safety provides some information about, let me jump to that slide, there we go. Some, as a part of training people to perform seeking safety, you know, social workers, case managers, school staff, emergency workers, those who are providing the interventions, seeking safety does help them build on cognitive and behavioral and interpersonal case management skills. Um, and there's some strong research evidence for it. So this was the only intervention that I could find that had some really good evidence based. But what I did find, uh, there we go, is sort of adjacent types of research that show the importance of specific activities, specific ways of interacting with people that are related to what we're going to teach you today. So. Let me jump into some of those. First, this is a meta-analysis. This graph came from a meta-analysis, which is a research study looking across multiple research studies. And what this particular study was looking for when it was looking across all these studies of different interventions was what was happening within each of these interventions that was related to long-term behavior change, where people were able to engage in the services and have positive outcomes and change their behavior in ways that were helpful for them and helpful for the community. And what this study found was that the specific technique that's being used is just 15% of what leads to long-term behavior change. So the specific model, CBT or DBT or seeking safety, by itself changes just 15%. And what really helps people change behavior is wrapping that technique 
with all these other things that you can do to help people. And one of the big chunks, 30%, was the staff-client relationship, that connection between people. So when clients feel alliance, that you all are working in the same direction for the same goal. So that feeling of not that we're doing things to people or doing things for people because they need help, but doing things with people so that we are working together toward the common goal of whatever behavior change we agree will help them have a happier, healthier life. So when clients feel that we have empathy for their situation, that there's a common humanity, and when we have positive regard, that feeling that we think well of them, that they are a good person that can do good things, that helps feel people feel connection and helps them engage in the services that we're providing. Now, 40%, which is a, you know, the largest chunk, is all the other things that are happening in these participants' lives, their family, their peers, their housing, their health, all of those things impact their ability to engage in the services that we provide and to change their behavior. So some of those things can be strengths that we can draw on to help them engage, and some of them are barriers that we have to help them um, work with and work around until they can engage in our services, help lower those barriers. And then finally, the last 15% is the belief that the intervention will work. It's the placebo effect that I think this will work. And it turns out when you have a good connection with your clients, you can help them believe in the intervention and help them believe in themselves. So all of these things really synergistically work together. And one of the lovely things about treatment courts is that we are set up as treatment court professionals to work in all of these areas. We can provide evidence-based practices. We can help them with those different extra therapeutic factors that are going on in their lives. We can help them believe in themselves and we can create a strong connection with individuals. Whoops. There we go. I looked or and found another uh, meta-analysis of research in neurobiology that shows that we are literally wired for connection and that social isolation can influence how people experience trauma and how much trauma they feel and respond to physically and mentally. So there's actual neurobiology changes in your brain. And one of those studies um, was a brain imaging study that showed that people who felt so socially isolated, that they felt that they had no connections with others, actually changed the connectivity in their brains. You could see it in their brain. They had diminished executive function, which means they don't make great decisions. They, have, they struggle with making good decisions. They have trouble keeping their attention on things. They're distractible. They have trouble remembering what they're supposed to do, you know, maintaining task sets. You know, there are a lot of things that we ask our participants to do in treatment courts that are not just one thing, but a set of things that they have to do. And one depends on the other and they'll lose track of where they are in that when they feel more socially isolated. In addition, people who feel isolated are more likely in social situations to feel that they're threatened um, and they have trouble with impulse control. So all this really is a good description of what we see in our participants, right? They, you know, it also has to do with their use of substances and the brain, how the brain has impacted that. And it's connected, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's circular, iterative. If the person is, has a substance use disorder, they often feel isolated from others. And so those feelings of isolation can exacerbate the things that are already in trouble in their brains. So I have a video. We, I did an interview with one of our treatment court participants. He's a graduate. And um, I asked him about what made a difference for him where he started to feel like he really wanted to be a part of this program. Um, and he's going to talk about Pat, who is the defense attorney on that treatment court team. Let's see if we can get this started. Pat was, um, and again, you know, later on the, the judges and, and my parole officer kind of got to be there, but he was really the first person I felt like that treated me like a person. 
that was respectful and treated me. He walked up on day one, gave me his card and wrote his cell phone number on the back and said, you know, I have a young kid at home, whatever, but you can call me middle of the night. You need anything, anything at all. I'm like, yeah, cool. He's like, no, if you need a pair of shoes, if you need a ride, if your world falls apart and you're going to go back to prison, you call me. I am here for you. And he was genuine. And we said it and I'm like, who is this dude? And why does he care? Like, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. Like, I feel like I got released to Portland and I'm in hippie town. Like, who is this nice guy? Like, why would he do this for me? Um, and it's just who he was and the support through the program, you know, finding clothes and getting rides. And they were honest. The support. And I think that was hard for a lot of people at first to trust, right? You're trusting the enemy, you're trusting the cops, but they wanted you to succeed. So there is some really good research in treatment courts, in particular a national study from several years ago where they looked across multiple treatment courts and they found that when the judge had a warm and positive demeanor, a welcoming demeanor, a caring demeanor, that participants were more likely to have positive attitudes for the judge and toward the team. And they were more likely to graduate from the program. They were more likely to, or less likely, to get rearrested later. And those programs actually saved more money, weirdly, in the end. So um, in programs where they use less traditional sanctions like jail, um, those programs had better outcomes. When they saw the judge more often, spent more time with the judge, for example, you know, judge spending at least three minutes per participant having those conversations, they had better outcomes. So that relationship between the judge and the participant was had a huge impact on participant outcomes, in particular when that relationship is positive and caring. And one of the things that that tells us is that it's really important for all of us, not just you know the judge especially is important, but all the team members. If you can find something that you genuinely like about each person, which some of our participants, not always easy. But if you can find just something that you like and remind yourself of what that is when you greet that person and when you're having that conversation, your demeanor will change and they will feel that difference. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail as we get into what you can do differently in each of your roles. Brian, I think, Dr. Meyer. Okay, would you so like to talk um, we're gonna talk now about trauma-informed roles on the team. And where the, I think the important place to start here is to notice um, the relationship of trauma and authority, because most of our participants have in fact been traumatized, as we've talked about in many settings. About 90% of people who come in with a mental health or a substance abuse problem uh, into the criminal justice setting have histories of trauma. And so how does a person who has a history of trauma come into a courtroom? And then you have to really look at the courtroom. And you know, when you look at a courtroom, uh, you know, the courtrooms can be pretty imposing. You know, you look at this one and, you know, there are columns and there's this, you know, these, they have great wood. All courtrooms have great wood. They look like executive boardrooms in, the, in their furniture. And these things are intimidating to most people. Now, if they have histories of trauma, trauma often comes as a result of either the action or the inaction of an authority figure, particularly when people are in childhood. So if they're coming from a place where it's childhood abuse and neglect, absolutely. Um, if that may be their first experience of trauma in their life. And if they are from a minority population, if they're a person of color or another major, uh, minority population, whether it is somebody who has a disability or who has somebody who is, who is from a sexual or a gender minority, um, or other kinds of, of minorities, uh, generally what the research says is that in fact, they tend to be treated worse in criminal justice settings, that they have two to three times as many arrests, as many uh, convictions, as many uh, days spent in jail, uh, the length of time in which they have sentences, all of these kinds tend to be much greater 
in a minority population. And so their impression of court when they're walking in is, oh, this isn't gonna be very good for me. And then we have to look at the flip side of it. And the flip side of it is that somebody who's experienced trauma, it was not under their control. That is one of the definitions of trauma, that it can't be something that you have control over. It happens to you um, and you don't have control over. And so then uh, what develops from that is a need for control. And then they come into court and it does not feel in their control. And they really feel like the judge and the rest of that team around controls what's going to happen to them. Okay. And so when they're feeling that out of kind of that out of controlness, then what happens is it activates their uh, trauma ideas. And so a lot of times, again, with people who've been traumatized, uh, they have this negative view that they have developed of authority because they have been harmed or abandoned by uh, people who are in positions of authority. And so that leads them to have what we would call a negative authority projection. It is a schema that a person has. They ha they, we all develop these kinds of schemas in our heads about the way that wor the world works and about certain kinds of people and what happens. And so we develop schemas about people who are in authority and uh, people who've been traumatized often have negative authority schemas. So that becomes their expectational set and they then respond in terms of their expectation, okay? Not in terms necessarily of the reality of what's happening in the courtroom at that moment, but in terms of their expectation. And what that leads them to often is one of three emotions. Anger, um, and that's because of the, the uh, fight mode, because their amygdala is actually activated, and then they're in a survival brain. And then what happens is they have fight, flight, freeze. And so anger is fight, fear is flight, and shame is freeze. And so these are three very common reactions that you can expect to happen in your courtrooms. And so what we're here to say is your job is to give them a different experience, not what they expect and not what they fear, but rather a different kind of experience that really is a trauma-informed experience. In other words, you can prepare for these things. You can know that they may have anger. What are you gonna do when they get angry at you? What are you gonna do when they take off? Because yes, our people do take off, they disappear. What are you going to do then? Are you going to attack them? Are you going to punish them for doing that? What are you going to do when they feel ashamed? Are you going to share the things that they are ashamed of, the details of their trauma? I hope that you're not going to do it. Although some preliminary data that uh, I developed in a study showed that 40 to 42% of them may expect to have the details of their trauma exposed in court. That's not a trauma-informed experience. So now what we want to do is to talk then about e the roles of each person. And obviously, we want to start with the judge, because as what uh, Dr. Carey said, uh, there is really good data to show that the judge has a very potent outcome on uh, uh, what happens in their uh, courtrooms. So Helen, would you tell us about that? Yeah, well, that photograph is just a great one. That's Judge Flurkey, and you notice he's down off the bench, and he's engaging one-on-one -on -one with this person. Uh, we don't use fear to control the courtroom. Uh, we don't make anyone feel personally responsible for the troubles they're having. Um, judges tend to have uh, uh, the sense of that they're the most negative authority projections in the courtroom. Uh, they're always perceived as very authoritarian, and many of the people that we work with in this high-risk, high-need population, indeed, they have had some negative experiences with bench officers, and so it is quite reasonable for them to uh, expect that this is going to happen again, and that they're going to have a bad experience. So when they come into our courts, we need to do exactly the opposite, right? We need to respond to things, not react. 
when people get all excited and they get hostile and they get angry or they burst out, very calm and compassionate responses because they're coming from a place that's internal and they probably have no control over it. Um, when people start to avoid, which they all will do, um, we reach out and we invite them to come back to us. Um, and uh, when they're frightened, don't use your power. Be very gentle and calm. I think one of the things that is important uh, to remember for all of us is the three T's. I call them three T's. Trust takes time. And we're going to have to be calm while people try to adjust to this strange looking courtroom. Um, what we're doing in these courtrooms is the opposite of what they've seen everywhere else, sometimes for the last 30 years or 40 years. So it's going to take some time and we need to practice it. I have a good idea. Let's not schedule a bunch of nasty, traumatizing cases right around the time when we're going to be working with other people. Um, do not make them wait a long time because their trauma and their stress builds up. Don't make them listen. Sometimes they're coming into court and waiting and we're in the middle of some hairy trial. Uh, they don't need to hear traumatic testimony. They don't need to um, see violence or anything like that. And so let's pay attention to what's going on before and after the courtroom. We want our atmosphere in our courtroom to be very calm, relatively quiet, not a lot of motion, uh, very supportive and not re-traumatizing. No big freaking surprises. Um, watch for signs of trauma in participants. If you can see them or feel them winding up, and this is not just the judge, but the whole team. If you can feel them winding up, um, React accordingly, give them a little time, see them first and move them out. Whatever it is that you're doing, know the person and respond in a way that will calm them and make it so they can hear and see what we're doing and not want to freeze, flight, fright, right? None of those things. Um, you step down from the bench. You uh, meet everybody at the same level if you can. And sometimes that's a, a safety issue. It's a protocol inside courts. But we know, we have no question at all, that when you sit down or when you're at the same level as someone else, it works better. Because our courtrooms are designed to intimidate and to look down. That's a bad plan. Um, take off your robe if it's legal and possible to do it. Um, in California, it's not. But in many states, you can take off your robe and, uh, you know, you can be one of the peeps. There's no, you don't have any problem with losing judicial authority. You got that. So the robe is just sort of a terrifying thing. You maintain transparency and predictability. And I would tell you if there's anything, it is us being predictable and consistent over and over and over. If people wind up, give them a time out. I used to see people get wound up in court and I'd say, Your Honor, could we do second call? And the defense attorney and the treatment people would go out and just calm them a little bit because otherwise I knew they are gonna do an outburst or do something we didn't want them to do and it might set them back. Who cares if they come back 10 minutes later? I don't. And then if they do have an outburst, use it as a teachable moment for everybody. And don't fly off the bench and get your power up. Everybody relax. People are going to sometimes do this. All of the things that Dr. Carey was pointing out, it's like the trifecta and your brain is just not going to sometimes react in a way that's controllable. Some of these people are terribly ill and they need some time. What else we got? Ah, I was a prosecutor for a lot of years. These things, this, like this thing here, these, there it is. These are scary. Some of them are big. Badges are big and scary things. Everybody who has a badge, you scare people. It's part of the reason we wear them, right? So when you're a prosecutor, your threats and your tough talk and being snarky, that doesn't help anything. It doesn't help. That's for another courtroom and another thing, but not this one. What turns out to actually work is your smile and your support and your quiet way of making things move forward. Um, if your constant messages of hope and help, it's magic. It makes a huge difference. There's a picture of me when I was a lot younger on there. And I was actually addressing our drug court and everybody in there, there are 50 people in there and I was using it as a classroom and I was telling them all about this thing is special and this is why we do it. And you want to engage and instill hope. Use your power. Don't get your power up. Good Lord. 
Um, use your power sparingly and only use it for good to clear away barriers, dump crummy cases, do things like that. Use your power to build hope and instill the willingness to stay with us long enough for the dose effect of treatment to take place because they got to stay with us a long time here, right? This is a lifetime of problems. Defense counsel, be clear and repeat often, my goodness, are these brains initially injured and they have pretty bad memory problems. So you guys, you got the hard job, right? I can get into the courtroom and I can show off. You guys can't. You got to be clear. You got to repeat things often. You got to remember in early um, recovery, people don't remember things. You have to listen. You have to share what you can about their fears and their needs without breaching confidentiality. But it helps if everybody understands that the guy that you've been working with or the woman that you've been working with is freaked out, right? So you stop with the legalese because we all, they, you know, you go to law school and learn to talk funny. But start with easy language and listen. And even when it's not the point, and, you know, lawyers were all trained to get to the point, get to the point. That doesn't help them. They need you to listen to them, even if it's not on point, because it is important to them. And we need to listen. Stay nearby them if they need it and support them. You know, standing up in front of a judge, that's some scary stuff. Having a judge ask you a question, that's some scary stuff. Your friend, the defense attorney, needs to be very nearby because otherwise their knees go out from under them and they freeze and prepare them for surprises and then caution the team. Don't surprise my person. They're scared to death, right? I mean, prepare them for something that may happen. If there's going to be a surprise, talk to them first, warn people what's coming. This is basic trauma 101. Don't knock somebody off their feet. So this is, this is a speech I gave, um, five days a week, pretty much. And um, it is just the way to get people. So good morning. My name is Helen. I'm the prosecutor assigned to this court by the district attorney. Some of you know me from other courtrooms, because let's face it, some of the people I was dealing with, I'd send them to prison repeatedly on methamphetamine labs and all sorts of other things. So I'd smile, say, hi, I'm here. Sorry. And I'm still here. The guy next to me is Steve. He's a defense attorney who is assigned here. If you haven't met him, he's really cool. Um, and like everyone else here, he's here to help you. And I go through this speech over and over, basically using calm language and saying everybody in this court does things differently. We've had special training and we know the stuff. The most important thing for you to do is show up. And as long as you show up, we got this. And it, you can read it later. It's boring. But the bottom line is simple language to really tell people we're here to help you. You show up and I got you. Over and over and over. Snarl less, smile more. Cell recovery. Um, move to gender specific sessions. We know that works better, much better. Um, women uh, do better when it's not mixed gender. And interestingly enough, men don't have to uh, impress women if there's a male only. Uh, courtroom. So it turns out for both genders, the tracks that are gender specific makes a huge difference. Move uh, to seated sessions at a table if you can. It is so less intimidating than this dynamic of looking down on people in a courtroom. Don't make any sudden moves. Do nothing suddenly. Give everybody a chance to hang in there for a minute and get ready. Take them aside if you need to chat. It's okay. Place participants in a protected and safe location with friends nearby like a defense attorney, like treatment, probably not like the prosecutor, uh, and make sure that they feel safe there, right? So that if they get scared, there's somebody to lean in or just lean forward and say, it's okay, this is normal. It's okay, this is normal. Because a lot of my people, they think they were suddenly going crazy. Well, they're not going crazy. This is normal. They're having a panic attack because this courtroom's doing all these things and it's scary, right? It's normal. And everybody, uh, counsel, all you lawyers who are watching here, of course, plenty intimidating. So for heaven's sakes, try to make it less, less so. But we still need to cover our record because let's remember, these are courts of law and this matters. So I say, I'm going to do some legal stuff. I'm going to talk like a lawyer. But then the rest of the time, we're going to do treatment stuff. So they know I'm covering the law, but I'm also here to help.
at everything you do with the end in mind. From the minute they come in, I am envisioning them getting a completion certificate. I very rarely use my field badge as a prosecutor, to be honest. Only in a couple of crime scenes where people didn't know me, I didn't care. But I commonly wore it, interestingly enough, when I worked full time in treatment courts. And I did that with a very specific reason in mind. I wanted them to learn to look at the badge as people who help you, not people to run from. Because that's what we teach citizens. As I go to the police or probation or the district attorney, they're here to help me. And that's a crucial life skill. And I want them not to fear me. Not just not to fear me, but to come to me if there's a problem. Because I can make it happen. I can dismiss cases. I can do those things. I used a ton of placebo and I sold engagement just like I would to a jury. No different. I thought the courtroom was a jury. I did the same thing. Different audience, same goal. Use your trial skills, lawyers, for engagement and wait for it, your smile. Smile. Freaking smile at people. It'll, they'll get used to it. It's a little scary and we're not trained to do it, but they'll get used to it. Treatment providers, what do you guys need to do? So let me talk about treatment providers. Um, so the first job of the treatment provider is to keep the team focused on the real story because what they did to get into court is always the tip of the iceberg. What happened to get them there is the real story. And there is always far more that happened to get them to that moment. And really, this is the great question for a judge to ask, and the treatment provider can cue the judge to ask the question, what happened that got you here today? And that's a great opening to have with somebody who is scared, because it allows them to tell something they are familiar with, which is their own story. The treatment provider uh, really understands the trauma-informed one, understands that the treatment court is a therapeutic entity, okay? We are actually using uh, intermittent reinforcement through the power of our relationships. And intermittent reinforcement is a psychological principle. And that is a therapeutic entity, that relationships are healing and that they are the most healing things that we can have. And so if we engage through the relationship, we become therapeutic as well. Um, the provider is also understanding that the, the key to reducing recidivism, in other words, they're not going to go through the same things that got them here before, the treatment is at the center of that. It's not going to be a punishment reward thing it's going to be what happens in treatment. So the treatment provider always keeps their eye on what is the role of the trauma in the participant's behavior and understands that when they're, for example, using substances, that there are a lot of reasons why somebody who, you, who is traumatized may, um, may be using substances. And it's not just as a coping mechanism um, or self-medication of some sort. There are lots of reasons. They may be trying to get to sleep. They may be trying not to have nightmares. They may be trying not to feel anything. They may be trying to medicate their physical pain. There's all sorts of reasons why people do it. And the treatment provider has to explain that to the court and help the participant understand that. Treatment providers also got to understand that lying is all over trauma and substance use. It's all over trauma because people don't want to tell you about their traumas. Uh, that is something that they absolutely avoid doing. And in fact, it's not appropriate for them to tell details of the trauma in the court. But lying is also all over substance abuse because what happens, you know, one of the behavioral things that we see in people who abuse substances is they lie. They tell you they didn't use anything. And then, you know, if they're their urine drug screen shows positive. Oh no, I didn't that or do that. Or oh, that must be wrong. Or they can give you all sorts of excuses about why um, their urine drug screen may have shown up in a certain way and just deny it. But lying is a method of self-protection there. Because what they found is if they tell the truth, they're gonna get in trouble. And here actually in the treatment court, we have the opposite idea which is that tell the truth. 
That's the thing that's going to help heal you. Lying isn't going to help heal you. And so we have to explain that to people, to the participants, and to the rest of the court. Um, they uh, talk about, as I mentioned before, the complicated relationship between trauma and substance use. And they're going to alert the court team to unaddressed uh, problems, because trauma is more than just, quote, PTSD. There is something called, we would call subclinical PTSD, which means they have some of the symptoms, but not all of them. There is a more difficult version of it that we call complex PTSD that not only involves the symptoms of PTSD, but also involves things like their emotional dysregulation, that it's going up and down, or it's extreme in some kind of way so that they're numb or they show anger. Um, they also look at relationships in complex PTSD, and most of them have histories of attachment disorder. And that means either they stay away from relationships entirely, or when they get into them, they get really scared as they get more intimate, and then they blow the relationship up. And finally, the other part of complex PTSD is that they have a very negative view of themselves. Well, that is not something we've had lots of discussion in in our treatment courts. Uh, it is now a diagnosis. And as of January 1st, literally, it's now an official diagnosis. And therefore, it's something that we really can bring in to help understand the person. We also need to address unaddressed problems, such as race-based trauma and stress. And this is something that has not traditionally been uh, addressed even in psychotherapy, quite frankly. And we have come to understand more and more that for people uh, of color, that race-based trauma and stress is its whole additional thing, which has, adds additional layers and even by itself can be so strong as to result in PTSD. The treatment provider is also going to look at the, the people who are coming, and they are going to scan the crowd and uh, recommend adjustments, like they may pass along a message to allow a certain person who they say who's being agitated to go first, or a certain person who is scared, letting them take a little while so that they can see how other people are going. So don't put those people first. Let them uh, go later on so that they can see what happens and warm to that. Um, the treatment informed provider is going to be really paying attention to um, participants who try to split. They say, oh, this is the good person, this is the bad person, often the bad people are the judge and the prosecutor, and the good people, you know, that's the defense attorney and that's the treatment provider. But you know what? That is really a coping mechanism. Young children use that coping mechanism. They go to one parent, they don't get what they want, they go to another parent, they get what they want, well, they're going to go to that one a whole lot more. But we know that what works in parenting is to present a united front. Same thing is true of the team. The treatment provider's job is to call attention to it when they see the team actually in, in being split apart by how the participant is engaging with them. The treatment provider is also always paying attention to when a jail sanction is being discussed or when program eviction is being discussed, is always saying, are there other options we have not tried here? What about the time when we blah, 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 and they made a special program for that person? Maybe we could make a special program for this kind of person. Um, and figure that out. They're also trying to attend to the fact that team members can be traumatized too. I mean, this is true when uh, team members have histories of trauma, uh, they're vulnerable to it, but it's also true that because of what happens in front of the, uh, the group, uh, that can be traumatizing too. If somebody's telling details, that's traumatizing. If somebody has an outburst, to some people who have been in victims of physical violence, that's gonna be traumatizing to them. And so it's important not only to pay attention to the other participants who are there and during the day of the docket, but also the team members themselves. 
And the, finally, they're going to be encouraging other team members not to take participant behaviors personally. Typically, the participants are acting out of a set of behaviors that they have learned for them is a way of coping with the world and has been the most successful way. Our job is to help teach them a different way. It's not personal how they're acting, it's what they've learned and are going through. Um, and the treatment provider, of course, has to be somebody who recommends trauma-informed interventions. So for example, um, they, they are going to have the participant actually uh, replay an incident, and I'm talking in psychotherapy, not in the, the courtroom, but they're gonna have them replay the incident or a relapse by noticing what the trigger is, paying attention to how they're feeling about it, paying attention to sensations in their body, noticing what happens when they have a certain behavior and what the consequences of that are, and working with them to find other behaviors that can be substituted and then practiced, and that's really important. Another trauma-informed intervention that a treatment provider will do is to engage in problem-solving exercises. So what they're doing is they're really trying to reactivate this portion of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is deactivated when there is trauma and it is deactivated when there is substance abuse. And we, part of our job is to reactivate it and literally to get people to think, to pay attention to the fact that when they act a certain way, they get a better result. To notice that certain times when they don't act in a certain way, when they act a, a different way, they get consequences and maybe that's not something they want. And with their treatment provider is also trying to help with any kind of trauma-informed intervention that is going to reactivate that prefrontal cortex. So one thing we can do is we can use bibliotherapy. So here's an example, once a warrior, always a warrior, which is great for veterans. Another one that, that is also excellent, uh, which came out last year, is a book um, called What Happened to You by Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey. And you can assign chapters in these books, have them read, come back with a verbal report about what they learned and how it relates to them. That's reactivating the prefrontal cortex. They can also use workbooks. And, and here's a couple of examples of workbooks. One is something called Finding Your Best Self, which is written by Lisa Najibitz, the same person who um, wrote Seeking Safety. And this is kind of a workbook that puts seeking safety into a workbook form. So it addresses both addiction and trauma. And another book um, that can be used is the, Di the Dialectical Behavior Therapy Skills Workbook. And this is about learning emotion self-regulation and about how to have um, good interpersonal relations with other people. Again, you can assign portions of these and have them come back, say what they learned and say how it relates to them as a person. Um, and back to you, Helen. Yeah, well, out comes the probation officer here. Um, Trauma-informed probation services basically require us to completely freaking alter our approach. Um, coming in and saying, what happened to you? Uh, tell me your story, as opposed to, what the heck is wrong with you? Right, which is how we often approach things, especially when we get frustrated. Um, Receives responsivity, focus on responsivity, obviously. We, you're using a strength-based research model, and this builds into that practice, and it should be basic probation 101 here. So we, we want to work with the protective factors, and we want to make sure that we're enhancing them. It is really not a specific intervention like sometimes we're taught. This is a way of doing business. This is the way you approach our business. Um, I'm looking to improve outcomes. I want to make sure that people stay and get healthy. And it is a, pro a process of doing critical thinking as it applies to each, each case, because each person we're dealing with, this isn't cutting widgets. These are people who have been harmed in an amazing uh, manner of, well, anyway, uh, the stuff that we learn about what's happened to people is sometimes shocking and requires us to go to treatment, right? But if we treat all them the same, we got a problem because they're not all the same. Uh, you've got to make sure that we're paying attention to each each person. And I know 
having been a chief, caseloads are sometimes not set up for that. But in problem solving courts, we should be able to get our, our data down so that we can get caseloads and really talk to the human being who's in front of us with all of the challenges they face. So we have a complex job and it requires a lot of public safety components. Um, we want to make the environment feel safe for our participants. That's during office visits, right? But it's also during field visits. And one of the things that I think is most important is that's also an officer safety issue. I want people to be able to understand what's going on. When somebody starts to wind up, I don't want them to accelerate it and turn it into an officer safety uh, problem or wrestling on the ground or having to arrest somebody and hook them up. I want officer safety cared for, and I want these people's safety cared for. And so you've got to learn how to de-escalate and figure out what's going on. And if you know the person, you know how to approach them. And you need to explain and explain and explain quietly, not in an officer command way, um, what you're going to do before you do it, including urine testing, which is very traumatizing, especially for survivors, uh, survivors of sexual violence. Um, Policies and plans and writing, because when they're talking to you, they can't remember. That's also indicative of early recovery, right? Short-term memory problems. So you want to make sure that you have things written down so that when their panic subsides, um, they can look at review what you said and what you're going to do with it, together with them. Recall the mind in a panic does not remember everything per perfectly or at all. And if you stop and think about the times you were panicked, um, it's kind of hard to remember it exactly. That's true of them too, right? Except we trigger panic sometimes when we show up and we catch them doing uh, a no-no. Uh, and if they think you're going to overreact, they're going to freak. And so it's about stepping through that carefully with them, precisely and calmly. Case planning always involves working with the probationer and with their input and helps them control part of their plan. Case planning is something we do with people, not to them. And so we want to make sure to get it small and biteable chunks. And then when they make something happen, it's party time and you incentivize them, right? Because that's a huge step forward and it builds trust. And please remember your yardstick is not the same as theirs. Baby steps showing up. We want to make sure that we're offering concurrent treatment and responses that are trauma focused while addressing all other comorbid disorders. Uh, I remember I, I used to joke about people that we used to call things dual diagnosis. And I can't remember the last time I saw someone with only two. Um, they have comorbid disorders up the kazoo. And the farther up the um, ladder we get with these people, the more problems they have. And so we need to be working those issues and working them closely with treatment. Treatment and probation should be like this. Constant communication one-on-one. -on -one. We want to focus on trust and safety. Mm -hmm. Focus on their dignity and their respect. Remembering the people who've been in the prison systems in particular. Respect is the foundation of everything that happens there. No respect, no survival. Uh, and so we have to respect them, respect where they come from. Uh, and make sure that you're clearly communicating and check for understanding because they're trained to say, yeah, I got it. Yeah. You understand that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, they don't. Have them repeat it back right? Use a lot of MI, a lot of motivational interviewing. Focus on strengths. Um, you know, we can identify barriers, but if all we do is say, well, you screwed that up, we go nowhere. I'm so glad you came today. I understand you might have a positive test, but you showed up. You told the truth. That's what we're after. Thanks. That's what we want. It's all about that, right? If you had to lie to survive, you were going to continue to lie to survive until you understand that telling the truth is the way through. And you can't work an honest program of recovery without telling the truth. That's why we keep saying it's a proximal goal, right? So you got to reward them every time they tell the truth. Look for ways to make things less threatening when they tell us the truth and less traumatizing. So if somebody comes in and tells you a nasty thing, don't run around with your hair on fire. Say, Thanks for telling me this. I'm glad you showed up today. It's got to be hard for you, right? Start with a smile. We're not kind of trained to do that, but give them all a smile. Flash those teeth and say, glad you're here. We're here to help. What are we going to do? All right. 
When you're out in the field, it's really easy to misunderstand behaviors and think they're resistant. And if I had a dime for every time I say, they're, they're just resistant. Um, yeah, well, they're resistant because they got all this stuff going on, right? And Or they're self-destructive. And frankly, they may be. They may be totally self-destructive. And who would blame them with some of the burdens they're carrying? You need to understand that they're what we're seeing sometimes, you see them kind of energized. You see their uh, muscles. You see the change in their face. That may be very well a physical response to coping with trauma. And so you've got to kind of de-escalate and work things around. People who are suffering from various forms of trauma are going to react differently. Some of them will boo-hoo. Some of them will start to fight. Some of them, they, all this stuff comes up. And you got to know what you're doing. Avoid triggering an unnecessary incident. If you can talk them down and just control it when it happens, right? If you can avoid that situation with some good field skills, you can avoid having an incident. You can avoid the paperwork of a violation of probation. All of these things work together. Um, and you get more resilience and more coping skills with them and you build trust. All of those things are important. Well, you know, your old skill set, I downloaded and read this thing 16 ways from Sunday front to back, back to front. Um, learn how you can do it. Learn how you can identify what's going on. And the whole team should be downloading this instrument and taking a look at this thing. Build these skills and everything you do, the way you think it should almost be your DNA. Each of our professions who comes to this table in treatment courts has tremendous value, but we all need to have that same view. That what we're seeing might not be what's really going on. That it's probably a manifestation of something else that's going on. And survival adaptation is the rule for these people, not the exception. They're not being resistant because they're dorks, right? They're sick and they're scared. And it comes from a place that they may not even know exists yet. That's after Brian and everybody gets at him and all that awful stuff. And farther down in court, when Brian and all these guys, all my treatment providers start tearing the scabs off of stuff and they all misbehave and you're like, what's wrong with this person? Well, that's what's wrong. They just got to it. And until they step through that and learn to manage with it, we're always going to have something going on with these people. Context, environment, history, culture. I saw people on here from um, some of the tribes I don't know. You think people from the tribal nations might have a little bit of trauma historically? I, I think it's quite possible. Like probable, like 100%. So creating a safe, envir a safe environment in our courts is important. And it's also important for your practices and your services. Focus. Focus on strengths and building resilience. It's the thing they didn't get. Coordinators, poor things, bad job. Okay, let me talk about the coordinators a little bit. So a trauma-informed court coordinator um, is going to be kind of like the prefrontal cortex of the court. They're going to be logical and they're going to be reasonable. Uh, that means they keep the trains running. And the way that the trains run is you grease the wheels with kindness. You know, we know kindness greases wheels. And we know that the irritability puts sand into the grease and prevents the trains from running. So it's really important that the court coordinator try to keep that in mind as they are doing all of the other work they're doing to keep the trains running. Um, one of the things that is important that they do is to make sure that the treatment provider's messages reach the judge. And this may include during a court session um, when, you know, they may have to pass a note or something like that. Uh, and the reason is because the treatment provider is going to be watching for signs of distress. They're going to be watching for signs of escalation. And it's also because these are treatment courts. Treatment comes before the word court. Um, and so we need to make sure that the judge knows what the treatment provider is thinking about things at all times. Um, the court coordinator also has to uh, be able to recognize secondary traumatization in team, uh, team members. And while we don't have time to talk about secondary traumatization a whole lot here, it's important to understand that it means that by hearing or seeing the experiences of others, 
or just being in a room with them and experiencing their distress levels that it activates our own. And it can uh, infect us in ways that potentially are damaging. And so the court coordinator kind of has to watch because they have to we watch over all the folks who are in the courtroom. And that includes every member of the team. And please notice that all throughout this, we are talking about how not only how we treat participants, but how we treat each other as team members. That is so critical in a trauma-informed court. We treat each other with the kindness and respect and watch out for each other when there are potentials for people to get secondary traumatization. Uh, the coordinator is also going to look for ways for the participant to have small amounts of control within limits. And again, this is kind of like uh, parenting. Uh, we allow our children to have small control amounts of control within limits. We can do it this way or we can do it that way. Which one would you prefer? There are ways that we can give them small amounts of control. And remember, people who are traumatized need some amount of control. If they feel helpless, they are uh, more likely to act out, absolutely more likely to act out. And so we want to give the, find these opportunities that we can have. Um, the court coordinator also needs to pay attention to the environment. Um, there are things that can make a trauma-informed environment, and here's some suggestions about what they are. Add boxes of tissues, yes, because people will try. Uh, they will cry in there, and so having tissues there can be really quite a helpful thing. Um, uh, softening the lighting. You know, we have all turned to fluorescent lighting, um, but there is there are ways to even soften fluorescent lighting. But anytime you get harsh lighting, people experience it as harsh. And we do not want to be harsh in a trauma-informed court. Uh, we need to be able to have some level of comfort uh, in it. It's also important to eliminate these loud ticking clocks. You know, loud ticking clocks are like the ticks of doom. They go tick, 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 tick. And it feels like something ominous is about to happen. You know, it's like a countdown in a bad movie. You know, you're listening to these ticks and something bad is about to happen as a result. If we can eliminate the loud ones, we can keep clocks in there, that's fine, but they just don't have to tick loudly. Um, we can lower the courtroom temperature. Why? Because temperature leads to temper. Uh, if you, you, the way you can understand this is just to think about when do we riot? Well, people riot in the summertime. Why? They riot in the summertime because things are hot. And we say when somebody is angry, they are literally getting hot. We say that. And so if we want to increase courtroom safety, and I think, you know, Helen makes points about this that I think are really critical. Another way to increase the court safety is to actually cool off the courtroom because then you don't end up with as much reaction because, I mean, who riots in the middle of winter? You just don't see that kind of thing happening. Another thing that can be done is to reorganize waiting areas to make them more comfortable, to make them so that people aren't staring right across at each other, which can feel a little on the confrontive side. We can organize them in a way that uh, makes them more conducive to quiet conversations. Uh, another thing that can be helpful is to move the podium to the sidewall. Why we put the podium in the middle of the room where the participant is going to have to stand facing the judge and then have their back to a whole bunch of people who are behind them. Well, you know, that's going to agitate anybody with trauma. This is called hypervigilance. They're going to always be wondering what's going on back there. They'll be looking back and to the side, and they'll be distracted, and they'll be agitated. If we move the podium to the side wall, then simply what happens is that the person has a, instead of having to have 360 degree view, they can have 180 degree view. And then they can see everything and feel like, okay, at least I know what's going on here. Uh, another thing that is helpful is to decrease the number of signs that say no. 
go and look in your courtroom and you will see lots of signs that say no. Um, and uh, the one that gets me always is don't wear shorts. Uh, you have to wear shoes. No, actually, it's much better. Why? I mean, it's a little late, okay? It's a little late when you say that. And it's also important to be sensitive and install multilingual sign, signage along the way. Um, the, for the team, the trauma-informed treatment team is going to think about trauma at certain times. And it really needs to be a subject of discussion at multiple points during these proceedings. Uh, one is during any team meeting. That's an important time. Another is when they're watching a participant's behavior and they're making observations about it. Is any of this trauma? Does any of this come from trauma? And if so, what? It's important to do it when listening to evidence of the participant's behavior for exactly the same reason. How does trauma feed into this? It's important to do this when we're interacting because we're gonna see these engagements where they're angry or they're afraid or they're ashamed. And we need to be paying attention to where uh, that is coming from. Another place we wanna do it is when we engage with the participant outside of court, because yes, the courtroom, you know, the docket is over and, and then people continue to talk afterwards. We need to remember that we're still in a role with them. And that role includes being trauma informed about these kinds of things. Uh, we especially want to consider it during incentives when we're considering any kind of incentive or any kind of sanction and what the impact of that particular incentive and sanction is going to be on the individual. Um, and, and then when we are delivering them, the way we deliver an incentive or the way especially that we deliver a sanction, we have to be really careful about so that it doesn't make the person feel harmed. So let me just say real, just a few words about trauma-informed communication. Oh, actually, I think this is someone else's, actually. Let me pass that along. Shannon, can you turn yes, on your mic? Yes, this is me. So let's delve in a little bit deeper and look at some of the information we have and research on trauma-informed communication. And you know, this slide says a lot. It's not what we say, it's how we say it. It's not what, it's how. So, boy, this is moving slow. <laughs> um, you really need to think about your face. It is really common to be unaware of what your body language is saying, what your face is saying. Helen will tell you that this is her face, this cat. <laughs> And she really has to pay attention to that. Um, so watch for that leaking body language. Listen for the positive. That helps you change your body language. When you're not focused on all the things that they're saying wrong or that they're doing wrong, but those things that they're doing right, that changes how you respond to them. So avoid the Judge Judy. If you want to look at how to not run your courtroom, go watch Judge Judy. So no snarky comments no shaming, no humiliating, no attacking, none of those things help our participants engage with us. That is not going to help our relationship. You wanna be respectful, you wanna be firm, you wanna be clear. Helen talked about the respect and I'm gonna talk about it in a minute too. And the key thing to remember is that the judge is the one who sets the tone um, in the courtroom in particular. That's your job as the judge to make sure that the courtroom has the culture and the feeling that you want it to have. So here's some research that talks about, in particular, the idea of respect and the opposite of that, which is humiliation. So there are studies that found that rejection by others, humiliation are highly correlated with depression and anger, and those are highly correlated with suicidal and homicidal ideation. So one study in particular, for example, there were 10 shootings that occurred between 96 and 99. And they found when they studied these different occurrences that the shooter had not only been bullied, but had been humiliated. And it was the humiliation specifically, and other studies found this as well, that bullying alone isn't 
you know, the, the key factor, it's that feeling that the participant has that they've been humiliated, that they've been unjustly mistreated and their dignity has been violated. There are really strong correlations between violence and humiliation. So I really like this quote and I have taken this for my motto as well, never allow anyone to be humiliated in your presence. It doesn't help anyone. So this is what uh, the first 60 seconds of a panic attack looks like. And it's not unusual for our um, participants, our clients to be in court or in another, you know, a situation where there's people in authority with badges, where this is all that's going on in their head. <laughs> they are, um, have, cannot focus during this time. And I can see Melissa coming on that we're getting low on time. So I'm gonna talk a little bit faster, but there are certain things that you can read about and I won't go into detail right now, but I will tell you that in order to help people reduce those feelings of panic and get out of that panic attack, you wanna approach them with caution. You know, Dr. Meyer and Helen both talked about these things, you know, creating the safe space, seating the client facing danger um, instead of having it behind them. Talk about what's going to happen next, put things in writing, being calm and slow and clear, really using those motivational interview techniques and don't have people leave the courtroom focused on the sanction or the negative thing. You want them to leave the courtroom at the end thinking about what they're going to do next, what you're expecting from them next, and what you know that they can do correctly, when they know how to do the right thing, they're gonna go forward and make the right choices. So make sure that they leave you with hope about what they're going to do next. And when they you know, drop that hairball in the courtroom, when they tell the truth finally, and it's an ugly truth, do not overreact. It's thank you for telling me. You don't have to say, yay! You know, like, you told the truth. You did this terrible thing. You can say, thank you for letting me know. I got it. Okay, now let's move on. Um, just patience, flexibility, being positive, and don't take the outburst personally. So uh, sometimes there are certain people who don't want to be hugged. <laughs> and some of our judges are huggy, and that's great. But make sure that your treatment provider or someone is telling you whether this person is appropriate for touching. So here's a question for you real quick. How much of your communication is in your words? Assign it a percentage. Well, there it is, only 7%. We think that we're communicating by what we say. However, that is not what people receive the most of. Most of what they receive is in our body movements, our faces, in our arms, our facial expressions. That's the bulk of it. Um, the second largest area is vocal aspects of it. And that's our tone, our modulation, where we're pausing, how loud we are. And only 7% is in your words. Really, it's a good idea to go talk to yourself in front of a mirror. It's a good idea to video yourself so that you can actually see how you are coming across to other people because we don't come across the way we think we come across, we come across differently. And you know this if you've ever recorded your voice and played it back to yourself and you go, that's not me. Well, actually it is you the way everybody else hears you. So practicing with videos, practice with mirrors, practice with recordings, so you know what you're really coming across like. Hey, and then we're gonna wrap up by giving you a few last pointers about things that you can do between court sessions to um, really stay that connected with participants, developing that relationship. So you can create short encouragement videos, the you know probation officer, case management, treatment providers, you can go to the judge and say, hey, judge, one of our participants did this great thing, tell them good job. And the judge can do a quick you know, 10 second video. Hey, I heard you helped your kid with your homework and he got an A, so proud of you, good job. And then you can send it to participants doing good morning videos the same way with the team. Like, hey, happy to see you. We're gonna see you in court today, it's great. Doing encouraging text messages from different team members. You remember to breathe, I know you got this. 
Um, you can write letters to participants from the team and they get something in the mail, which can be really encouraging. And how, how exciting is that to get something that's not uh, spam in your, <laughs> in your home mail uh, or not a bill? Um, you can do quick, what did you learn video chats with participants, you know, talking to them instead of having them come in, you can have a conversation. I know you did it, had a treatment session today and you did some homework, how'd that go? So you can have that kind of in-between connection using the technology that we've really learned to use even better during the pandemic. So Dr. Meyer, I think this is yours to end us off. Um, okay, so we'll end up with this. These are the themes we've been talking about. And the most important thing to remember is that we have to give them hope. If we can give them hope, then they can believe that things are going to get better. And you saw that's a really important factor in actually getting better. Treating them with dignity, treating them with respect, listening calmly, even when they are upset, asking open-ended questions rather than yes-no questions, using a moderate volume rather than a loud one, sounding compassionate. All of those things are really important. We're not gonna go over this slide, but here are some examples that we give you and you will be able to see these when you get your copy of the slides. And as it's been said, you will get them. Same thing is true of this list of helpful and hurtful kinds of communication um, that are important. And um, so there are a couple of slides that are that have these kinds of things on them. I'm gonna to try to knock through this really quickly um, so that we can come to the last point here that we wanna make. Um, and um, this is, uh, whoops, this is yours, Shannon. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm the researcher, I get to do this part. So. Um, yes, this is a call for research. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, I was unable to find research in the field for these specific practices that help people engage in those treatment services that we're providing them for their trauma. You need to, it's how you do it, right? Not just what you do, not what you say, but how you say it. So we are, you know, looking for the opportunity to do some research, looking at these approaches, um, as I said, there are tangential research that supports everything that we told you, but we'd love to do it in treatment courts where each team member is engaged in these activities and we can see what those outcomes are. So if you have interest in research, feel free to write myself or Dr. Meyer or Helen or all of us and let us know of your interest and we'll keep you um, in mind for the future when we get some potential funding to study this in more detail. And there, there are some um, resources here that we have attached to this presentation. Um, so uh, we have the books and workbooks that are here and all of the various um, uh, articles that we have cited here, um, Ashley Sabatino has kindly uh, listed out for you so that you can get to them. And if you wish to contact us, these are the places that you can reach us. All right, thank you so much. And uh, I, yeah, thank you to all of our presenters today. And I think that you'll see in the chat um, how, how much people have appreciated all of this information. And um, just so that folks know, yes, uh, if you registered for this event, you will get a follow-up email with the slides and a notification when this uh, recording is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel. And look, look at all the applause. Uh, I know I, I love I love zoom and, and how interactive it can be so thank you all for your feedback for our presenters and um, we have a little bit of time for questions so there's to... a question or a concern about accountability that I see has come up twice um, you know I, I'll tell you right now um, accountability is a part of treatment courts there's no question about it but how we use accountability simply cannot be um, a fist and um, we hold people accountable by saying this is disappointing and I was very concerned about you. And for many people who are traumatized, that's plenty. Um, the fact that we're in a court, the fact that there are badges and people standing around, we can lean in if we need to. But that has just got to be the very 
last thing we do. And even then, you have to pay attention to how you're doing it because these are all medical models. First, do no harm. Don't make it worse. And so sometimes it is the absolute, uh, it's something that's contrary to my training as a probation officer and as a prosecutor, you know, because I always want to go in there and get them. But it turns out that's incorrect in this forum. And so, yes, we hold people accountable. Yes, we find out what they're doing. It is important for behavior modification that we catch them doing wrong and catch them doing right as much as possible. But we simply cannot come out with a heavy fist. Um, if there's a public safety issue, that's one thing. But otherwise, no. This is a long-term process of in intervening with people who have such deep and wide problems that if we just go in and whack them in the head, that's why they're still in the justice system because that's what we've done for the last 30 years is whack them in the head and it doesn't change the behavior. So is there accountability? Absolutely. Does it look like what we did last time? Absolutely not. Doesn't work. Thank you for that. We need to be doing what works. Uh, Brian or, or Shannon, would you like to add anything to that from your perspectives? I think Helen covered it. I think it's really important to understand you already have the authority. You do need to call it out. You can't just let it go when they're doing something that's inappropriate, but you don't have to hit them with a fist. It's, that was inappropriate. We're disappointed that you did that. We're concerned that you're going to hurt yourself. We don't want you to do that. Here's what we want you to do instead. Let's talk about how you can do that. That's the kind of accountability that will work for most folks until you're getting to the point where they're, you know, there's the fear that they're going to hurt others, you know, that's something else. But um, yeah, I think that's really important. And again, focusing on what they're doing right, because so often they have a PhD in how to do it wrong. Yep. They, got they that really down. don't know how to do it right until you point it out to them. That was it. That's what we wanted to see. Good job. Do that again. Yeah. I'd like to question answer, about whether we come across as condescending. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to answer that one. Um, because I think this really has to do with sincerity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when if we if we are putting this on as a mask and this is not something that we are genuinely feeling, believe me, these people have BS detectors. That BS detector is a survival mechanism. It is one of the things they learn how to do really well. So if we aren't being genuine, they can read it. And even if we are being genuine, they're kind of like the guy who was in the video that, that uh, Dr. Carey showed you before. Because he's like, wait, he seems like he's a nice guy, but I don't know if I can believe this. Remember that they are not used to people being caring and caring about them. They're used to getting negative messages. It's not a matter then of condescension, but in fact, when you're getting awkwardness as a response or some confusion as a response, it means you're doing it the right way. That's really great. And that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for is, oh, thank you for being such a wonderful person because you know sometimes we need our BS detectors up too because you know some of these people are used to using BS as a coping mechanism and a survival mechanism. And what Dr. Meyer said about Kyle in the video, you know, he said, but they were genuine. You know, at first he was like, what? But it was because they were genuine that it made a difference. And, and that's also why I mentioned earlier, finding something you like about the person so that you can be genuine. Um, because they will feel it if you're just putting it on. Anything else you want to add to that, Helen? Nope. Okay. So uh, I think I'll end with one question about uh, research. And, and we did have a participant chat, but they are doing some trauma research at Duke University. I don't know if you saw that, Shannon. Um, so someone did ask a question about the research regarding brain imaging mentioned earlier. Will this cutting edge technology be utilized more to detect trauma in our field? So just wondering what your thoughts are on that. And I'll start with Dr. Carey. Um, I will 
they, I think that is a fascinating question and I will answer it by saying, I don't know, but it's a great, <laughs> I need to go look it up now um, to see how much, I, I don't know how much you can actually detect trauma from any, for other, you know, from other brain things that might impact your brain. You know, the difference between what the drugs are doing to your brain versus what trauma is doing to your brain. Um, it may, I, I imagine that people are working on it. And I almost, you know, when I saw that, I wanted to start Googling it right away. Um, so I, I will be going away and looking into that further for sure. So I have looked into that a little bit. Um, and let me say that um, while there are people who are very much proponents of it, and while we can, without a shadow of a doubt, um, actually identify different areas of the brain that are affected by trauma and their activation and deactivation, and we can see that in traumatized brains, uh, while that is all true, these kinds of uh, detection methods are extremely expensive uh, because either they look at electrical activity in the brain or they look at blood flow in the brain. And uh, being able to put markers in the blood to see it, being able to put a lot of electrodes onto people's heads to see it, uh, these are expensive things to do. And whether we become willing to have a more uh, biological way of how uh, we're looking at people's brains as an assessment method when there are other methods we also use, um, you know, part of that is frankly up to insurance companies. Um, and that's a legitimate thing. You know, insurance companies are willing to pay for certain methods of assessment, and they may not be willing to pay for other methods of assessment. Thank you for that. So uh, more to come, hopefully lots more to come in terms of research and, and more progress. But I think that this presentation is cutting edge. So Thank you so much, uh, Brian, Shannon, and Helen. Um, I do want to just switch over to a couple more closing slides so you all get the information you need. We are going to pause the chat. So um, if you have anything further you'd like to say, uh, hang in there. We want to pause the chat, and um, we're going to drop the certificate of webinar attendance in the chat and give you all a few moments to download that. And uh, so you just look in the chat, there's a document, a PDF document, click on it, and then follow the instructions to download that to your computer. Let me move to the next slide, please. Uh, we've got a closing poll. Thank you. If you will participate that, uh, just participate in that, and that just provides the Game Center a little bit more information about future work. If you haven't signed up for the listserv, here is a condensed URL that you can enter into your favorite browser. It will take you to a page where you can sign up for the Game Center's listserv. And thank you, Ashley just dropped the link into the chat as well. And we can move to the next slide. Um, if you didn't have your questions answered, we did pause on uh, the slide with our presenters' contact information um, so you can contact them directly. There's also information for the Game Center. If you want to contact us at the Game Center, we can also support you with um, answers, finding answers for your questions, or linking you with the presenters. Our website and direct phone number are listed here on the bottom of the screen. Uh, so again, the Game Center, we are able to provide some limited support for folks who reach out to us seeking information. Uh, so there's another source for support and that brings us to, I believe, the end of our webinar. So um, we'll get you out one minute early. Thank you so much, and um, have a wonderful rest of your evening. And, and once again, thanks to our presenters. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>